Well, thanks again, everybody. I'm going to talk about transitions, um, not so much about post-COVID transitions, but transitions in general. And I'm going to be talking about five areas of intervention, designing, thinking, strategies that in my mind are, are essential to thinking about transitions and doing transitions. This might not be the best title, but we'll, 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 we'll think about it at the end. Uh, but I'd like to start by talking a bit about COVID. And this is a, a, one of my favorite uh, quotes, statements about the crisis from Arundhati Roy. Most of you might have seen it already. It talks about a rupture, discontinuity, an inflection point. And, uh, you know, the, 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 summer, the summer course is very much about this. It's about this continuity that has been introduced in the world, in this case, by this particular virus. Okay, and and but that is it is a potentiality, and this is central to obviously to the futures cone conceptualization that the transitions won't necessarily happen, at least not in the way in which we might want to. So, on what does it depend that might happen, and especially that idea of not going back to normality. And the second quote is from an Afro-Colombian feminist from my city, Cali, a good friend and colleague. Maria Campo, that asks, how can we continue to deconstruct and criticize patriarchy, this kind of patriarchy that is killing us physically and spiritually? Because those mandates of stay at home and wash your hands are a fallacy from our perspective, given the inequities and injustices of the capitalist system. This capitalist system is the real pandemic we are saying. So this to me talks about the unevenness of the effect, and we are aware of that, of the impact of the crisis. Finally, this is my favorite slogan to come out and circulating a lot, at least in Latin America, as a result of the crisis. No volveremos a la normalidad porque la normalidad es el problema. That has actually started to emerge in Chile uh, in, in last year as a result of the protests in Chile. So we shall not, we shall not go back to normal because normality was the problem. So very, very profound. What was that normality that was the problem? That normal way of doing things in the contemporary world that is part of this as well. And I wanted to just show this as a reminder that we are doing this class as in the US, uh, the protests against police brutality, against uh, especially black people in particular, and the profound anti-Black racism and racism that exist in most of our societies. So this is, has to be part of what we take into account for our transition thinking. Now, finally, to give you a sense of the contents of the talk, I'm going to be talking for about 45 minutes, I hope, beginning now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, the relationship between design and crisis and transition. They would talk a bit about what I think is very exciting about design, the design studies field, design walls, which is how it's emerging and positioning itself as a very important domain for thinking about life and about world making. Uh, and in the last part, really, which is, which is about half of the talk, um, I will talk about those five lines of action or domains of action and thinking that I believe are important for thinking about transition. I call it a proto-research through design inquiry because it's not going to be linked explicitly to design. To some extent, yes, but mostly not. And that's what I said that will be great if the participants do a little bit of that thinking. So design is design part of the crisis or is is, is it part of the crisis or is part of the solution? And of course, it is both. It is worth sustaining and it is worth destroying. So we're faced with the collapse. You know, collapsology in France is something that is growing. Extinction Rebellion, of course, in the UK, in many parts of the world. Uh, connected to climate collapse, of course, but beyond that. And all of this reminds us that what is at stake is life itself. That what is emerging with force today is the idea that life is at stake and that we need to think about life and how we live and what, what life means in a new way. And so this has tremendous implications for what we do in the design field. In Latin America, all of this is referred to as civilizational crisis and civilizational transitions. I could show you many examples of what, they, what is meant by that in Latin America. These are just two. The first one on the left is from a, a summit of indigenous spirituality 
spirituality, very interesting, that took place in Bolivia five years ago. And the subtitle is, or capitalism dies, or mother, mother earth dies. So it's either earth or capitalism. So it's a very clear anti-capitalist or post-capitalist mandate as seen from the perspective of indigenous peoples and poor peoples in Latin America, which led the Zapatista in 1994 to launch this idea that another world is at the forum in 2001, another world is possible. And the Zapatista, 1994, that we want, we don't want to fit within this world as it exists. We want a world where many worlds fit, which to me is one of the definitions that I like to quote about the pluriverse. This, I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is actually from a degrowth conference in Venice in 2012 that I participated in that I reworked a bit for a conference in Barcelona two years later. So just to tell you that, and I think it's, it's, uh, Stefano was given a sense of this, that there are many ways of thinking about transition today. I call them narratives of transition. Chapter five of the Science for the Pluriverse is devoted to that in many ways. They are differentiated, those in, in the global north uh, from those in the global south, but increasingly connected. And uh, so, the idea of a great transition, this is the concept by a group based in Boston, the Great Transition Initiative, which is a very interesting group, has a fully worked out framework for transitions that has been developing over the past 20 years, and transition activism, so that we are all faced with the idea that we have to become transition activists in our work and as designers. So design then uh, is... If the world is in crisis, there's a, do a twofold sense of crisis here. The world is in crisis, and hence design is in crisis as a fundamental political technology of the creation of the modern world that design is. Design is also in crisis. So the question is, can we conceive of design as in transition itself? so that it can be at the service of the larger civilizational transition. And the stakes are very high in the sense that the crisis is the crisis of this, what John Law, English sociologist calls, the one world world. This world supposedly made up of a single world, the capitalist, patriarchal, uh, globalizing world, one single global market and global village, so to speak, or which is the world within the world that we have created for ourselves. This is the concept from Tony Fry that we through design a world within the world of our own making, but we're not aware that that world has been, as, as in the Escher diagram, painting, drawing, that that world is, is of our own making, which brings into the picture what is, for me, one of the most exciting things about design today, which is that the, the, the facing to the, the growing awareness, as Jonathan was saying, that design has an ontological dimension. But in designing tools, buildings, houses, health systems, whatever, we're designing ways of being, ways of existing. And it, as we have been doing that, that has led to the futuring, again, another term by Tony Fry, meaning by that, the doing away with all possible futures, but the future of capitalist globalization, sort of modernity understood in particular ways and so forth. So the, this summer uh, uh, school's course is precisely about opening up the future again. It's about the future. It's about multiplying futures again, thinking about all the possible futures. Um, so design is emerging as an important cultural political project. I think the seminar is part of this. Not obvious in all of design is going through this transformation. This is a sort of a subsector or subset of design. Again, we find different emphasis in the global north and in the global south. Just to mention a few in the global north, design for social innovation, transition design, uh, ontological design, design justice, just transitions. In the global south, there's a plethora of ideas about decolonizing design, designs from the south, et cetera, et cetera. I think together, the conversations between global north and global south around these, these design issues is leading to the creation of a transnational critical design studies that I will define in a moment. So again, the basic idea that design is emerging as a domain of thought and action concerning life and world making. So what is it that is 
coming into place in design. I often like to use paintings, figures, illustrations. And this to me is one of the most beautiful ones I found is by young Colombian graphic designer, uh, Angie Vanessa, um, Vanessa, Vanessa Roa, or Angie Vanessa, that's her pen name. And this is conveying the idea that we humans are earth, that we humans are rivers and mountains and turtles and water and sun and plants and animals, that we are earth beings, we are pluriverse. And hence, this new way of understanding reality, which is based on the concept of relationality. Another way of defining relationality is radical interdependence, the radical interdependence of everything that exists. That for anything to exist, everything else has to exist from the get-go, from the beginning. And you find these really beautiful expressed even by some scientists, I'm, I'm going to call from one of them later on, by the idea of relationality, as opposed to a world based on separation and separate entities, uh, individual versus community, subject versus object, mind versus body, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And instead of this continuity between everything that exists, for instance, these other representations, uh, the first one is from painter that works out of the work of Lynn Margulis, a wonderful biologist who shows how 3.5 billion years ago when life started, from the, very, from the very beginning, life was interaction, life was interrelation. There couldn't have been life without interdependence. The concept of endosymbiosis or all the wonderful representations of, of, uh, of the same idea that we are, we are humans Earth, we are humans, mangrove, we are humans, food, we are humans, microbe, we are humans, everything. So this idea of interrelationship, which is our relationality, which is central to what in contemporary theory, and I know Stefano was mentioning that you're going to be having to be doing a map of sort of the theories that you're going to be talking about, is usually described as, in, with many different concepts, post-dualist social theory in the sense that there's a social theory that goes beyond those dualisms of binaries that I mentioned, like um, uh, nature versus culture or human non-human, uh, West non-West, secular, sacred, etc., etc., etc. So it's a social theory that reunites in particular the human with the non-human, that the making of the reality is a if, if you wish, reality is a co-creation, a co-design between humans and non-humans of all kinds. So at the intersection of critical design studies and post dualist social theory emerge other proposals. What do I mean by critical design studies? Is the application, what results from the application of critical theorists, critical th theories, feminist theory, post-structuralist theory, post-dualist social theory, etc two design studies. One particular proposal is, and I mentioned this because it's been fresh in my mind, and it's because uh, some of you might have been at the February 21st Desis Philosophy Talk on the Politics of Nature, or last week at the conference in Manizales, Colombia, for the Participatory Design Conference, that was the week-long conference, in which um, a, we did a great session uh, organized by Ana Linda and Ezio Mancini and Virginia, Virginia Tassinari on the notion of transformative social innovation. So this is a particular proposal that emerges at this, at this interrelation of this, what they call, what Mancini and Tassinari call a post-anthropocentric design and led by this question, which I think is a very interesting question. Can then design stop being anthropocentric? Can it embrace the idea of radical independence and then make of that post-anthropocentric design the basis for concrete interventions into the real world? They base that on ideas of interdependence and the ideas of the terrestrial from Latour, care from Maria Puig de la Valle Casa, pluriverse and so forth. So like a new pact between humans and the earth, um, in the creation of this. There are many sources for thinking about relationality and independence. The map is all over the place already. Many indigenous cos and cosmovisions and struggles uh, arise from deeply interdependent cosmologies, 
social theory, as I mentioned, in the natural and physical sciences, complexity, self-organization, and emergence, autopoiesis. In social struggles and activist knowledges, in many ways, are about the defense of those social realities, social formations that are created on the basis of interdependence and not so much separation. And in art, we find many ideas for that. In the Global South, we have a whole span, as I mentioned, of proposals as well. Um, um, and all together, I think what we're witnessing today in this critical design studies field is this new kind of ontological political field that emerges at the intersection of social practices, experiments, including design experiments and struggles, and critical theory on the other hand. So we're going to see a little bit some examples of this. Um, so let's begin then to talk more explicitly about, about the transitions and the ideas for transitions. I'm not going to relate it to the cone, to the futures cone explicitly. I think you can think, all of you can think, participants about whether this belongs to the, with the possible or the plausible, or maybe the preposterous that appears in some of the formulations of the cone. But what I want to emphasize is that this, all of this is already happening. All of these sort of transition-oriented practices and initiatives. I start with the definition of radical alternatives. This is from the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. It's a group with which I work, which defines these alternatives are those initiatives that are attempting to break with the dominant systems and taking new paths, taking new paths. Their space of working, their space of thinking is not the state and the capitalist economy. They try to move away from the state and the capitalist economy. They try to dismantle hierarchies, obviously operating on the basis of other principles of sufficiency, autonomy, and so forth. Of course, they exist in the real world, so they have links with capitalism and the state, but they prioritize their autonomy. I like this formulation by David Bollier. This is from an interview, um, and which is one of the main people thinking and writing about the commons and commoning, who likes to see that these, these alternatives, these initiatives are already sprouting in many different parts of the world, and they find each other and they begin to replicate and coordinate and leading to what he calls in that interview and the interview is entitled the commons is a pluriverse the commons is a pluriverse so this idea of these these um, uh, islands of of uh, of new ways of, of groups that are taking new paths and begin to reconnect with each other and begin to create maybe you know uh, Ezio Mancini uses the, the metaphor of the archipelago of alternatives that begin to form a continent that begins to emerge. So that's sort of the, is that possible, plausible, preposterous? I don't know, but it's already happening. So here are the um, five axes. And in the sort of, we have about almost half an hour left, 25 minutes left, and I will devote to explaining these axes. So if, if I think about access or principle for the strategies for transition and for redesigning, I can think at least about these five, and these are the main five for me. First, the recommunalization of social life. Faced with a individualizing globalization, we had to recommunalize social life. Second, also faced with the delocalizing globalization, we had to relocalize activities, economic, social, cultural activities. There's a lot, of course, in transition movements about relocalization. Uh, third, um, we need to do it in a way that fosters autonomy, local autonomies. And those are three that are very uh, pragmatic in a way. You can insert particular strategies and practices and projects, prototypes even, on these first three. The next two are more general and abstract, perhaps. And the fourth one is that there has to be a deep patriarchalization, deep racialization, and decolonization of societies and social relations. We live everywhere to a greater or lesser extent in deeply patriarchal 
white supremacies, racist colonial societies. Uh, so we need to undo those. And the fifth one is the reintegration with the earth. We can use that tool to say down to earth or de ter terrestrializing uh, our practices. We can use re-earthing is another concept that we can use. Uh, the NASA indigenous peoples from Colombia has developed this amazing, sophisticated framework to talk about the liberation of Mother Earth. That's another articulation of that. And the five together very much are about how do we work towards the flourishing of life and the enhancement of the pluriverse. So these are some of the ideas. And for each axis or principle, especially the assignment will be to find design criteria, to imagine projects, and relate to possible futures. Okay, so now let's begin to each one of them. And this is going to be very short. I'm sorry, there's going to be a lot of text. Uh, this being a virtual presentation, I feel that I, I need to have the text. I, I rather prefer the personal face-to-face -face presentation so I can I can pace around and, and sort of perform, but we cannot do it uh, this way. Okay. So first, the recommunalization of social life. Why? Because globalization has been a war against everything communal and collective. It's like globalization is about destroying what is collective. We have to say no to individual solutions to the COVID crisis because they disadvantage the most oppressed peoples in the world. We also have to resist the individualizing tendencies fostered by market and digital technologies. Why? Because in many ways, human experience has been place-based and communal always, and, and the place-based and the communal continues to be a very important part of what, who we are as humans. In Latin America, there's a whole uh, sets of research and, and debates in activism and in the academy about what is called Communality, communalidad, communalidad is a, is a new term, it's an invented, an invented term, it was invented in Oaxaca about 20 years ago, to name precisely that communal condition of being human, uh, and the fact that we, as, as individuals, as persons, co-emerge with living beings and their worlds and with each other as well. Um, so, the implication of, of radical interdependence in particular and communality is that we need to develop an ethics of love and care and compassion that starts at home with place and community and moves up. In Oaxaca, they talk about uh, pensar nosotricamente, again, is another new term invented, to think and make in terms of a we. Not in terms of a me, not in terms of an object, not in, not in terms of any isolated entity. Always think and make in networks, so to speak, uh, for compartencia, compartencia, another invented word for sharing, for sharing. And so we can we can uh, think about very common concepts today, like that of resilient communities. What what do we make out of this concept of resilient communities uh, under the principle of recommunalization of social life? Second one, this is probably the easiest one to see, the relocalization of social productive and cultural activities, where it is because of ecological uh, costs of globalization or social costs or whatever, we have to resist delocalizing pressures, displacement, by extractivist operations, my forces, forced migration as well, dispossession. And, and uh, one of the things about COVID-19 is that it has brought to the picture again, the importance of the local and the role of real people. One of the main environmentals in Colombia, Tatiana Roa says that, that the last few months in Colombia at least has proven that it has been people, particularly peasants and others in the cities as well, that has been saving poor people. It hasn't been the state. It has been the reconstitution of food production and distribution 
in neighborhoods and cities and out of the countryside that has been able to. So that kind of relocalization is super important at the local. So we need to relocalize what's possible. Obviously not everything can be relocalized, but certainly co common in, uh, there's a lot of ideas about social and solidarity economies, about Buen Vivir, about degrowth. The Transition Town Initiative handbooks, some of you might know those handbooks. If you don't, you should. It's a great design help. Uh, they are full of ideas about how to relocalize food, energy, transport, many things. Uh, again, in Mexico, they tell us we need to move towards thinking about verb, in terms of verbs, to eat, to learn, to heal, to dwell, to know as opposed to just receive from the state or from the system or from capitalism, food and education and health and, 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 and built environments, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very important distinction. And food, of course, is one of the main activities worldwide of this relocalization. All these ideas about food so sovereignty, agroecology, saving CSAs, urban gardens, uh, new interfaces between country and city. That's a very important urban design issue. How do we build interfaces between country and city that are conducive to this relocalization and to uh, food sovereignty in the cities? An overall need to think about is need to rethink the economy and obviously energy. There are two books that I'd like to recommend for that. The first one is the new book by David Bolley and Silka Helrich, Free, Fair and Alive. It's a great book. It incorporates all the ontological dimension of design. It's very design friendly, has full of diagrams and pictures and concrete ideas about how to rebuild the economy on the basis of the commons. And Take Back the Economy, some of you might know this as well, by Gibson Graham, uh, Cameron and Healy, uh, which is a guide, it's a, it's a user's guide to how can we take back uh, markets, finance, labor, and so forth. So do take a look at those. Uh, the third axis or principle of a strategy is that of strengthening autonomies. <clears throat> okay, so it is clear more and more that in this world are such abhorrent inequalities and that keep on growing when 0.1% of the population control almost as much wealth as, as half of humanity. Uh, our democracies are not working. There is a facade democracy. So we need to move to a different kinds of democracy. Some people talk about the direct democracy. In the social movement sector, in both, I mean, there's a lot of this in Europe as well, at least in Southern Europe, uh, autonomia, autonomy, is an important concept and it is, the necessary companion of recommunalization and relocalization. With autonomy, recommunalization and relocalization might be reabsorbed again in newer forms of delocalized reglobalization. Re so autonomy, autonomia in Spanish in Latin America, well, in Italian obviously as well, is a different way of thinking about politics. And politi what is politics? Politics is the reconstitution of the entanglements between human and the earth, between humans and non-humans. And how do we do that in less hierarch hierarchical ways? On the principles of sufficiency, mutuality, conviviality, self-determination. I have been witnessing in a very interesting way how the concept of mutual aid or mutuality and conviviality, a concept really introduced by Ivan Illich in the 60s, have is, are experiencing such a very interesting comeback uh, as a result of the, of, of the COVID-19 breakdown and rupture. So we need to keep uh, the, the pressure on not going back to the older ways of doing things, but cultivating these principles uh, of relocalizing, recommunalizing, and mutuality, conviviality, and, and so forth. Autonomous design, which is the idea that I've been working on, and is chapter six in the science of the pluriverse, if, if any of you is interested, begins with this principle that, that is that every community practices the design of itself. 
Most communities, especially quote unquote post-traditional communities don't do that anymore. They are designed, designed by expert mechanisms from the state and the academy and capitalism. Uh, we, we no longer design our own existence for the most part. We do, we do it, but we do it in conditions that are given to us by, by modern expert systems and knowledges. So we have to go back to having this idea that we can practice the design of our, ourselves as communities and in ways that are conducive to non-patriarchal, non-racist, non-liberal, by non-liberal I mean that are not so mediated by individualism and private property that consider other forms of being more collective and of the economy, most post-capitalist forms. And one of the main re requisites for this is to be able to understand what is the political project of the communities we're working with, the political project of the communities we're designing with. This is a requirement of all any activity that is carried out under the banner of autonomous design. Um, it is a misconception to think that when people talk about autonomy uh, or about resisting these new trends of globalization is because you want to go back to the past. I don't, I don't know any single community in the world that is saying that we need to go back to the past. Even indigenous communities, black communities, Pacific communities in Latin America, they definitely want to defend their autonomy. They want to defend their worldviews, their, their cosmovisions. But as this, a, a traditional miner from Northern Cauca, gold miner, a uh, very poor woman without formal education said, the essence of the ancestral is to look towards the future. So the appeal to ancestrality by many of these movements that are opposing extractivism is to make other futures possible. So we meet there, we meet in this idea that we have to make all futures possible, a universal future. And then we can think that autonomy or autonomy is a, a practice of inter-existence. That autonomy is not to, to isolate yourself. We don't want worlds that want to isolate themselves. This is a common misconception as well, but rather worlds that want to interact and interrelate because that's what life is about, but from the perspective of their own autonomy. The three, the first three areas together, I think, really question globalization as we know it. Why? Because they require, they involve a significant reorientation of our ways of being, uh, recentering of a more autonomous production of life in the territories, in the places, wherever we are, anywhere in the world, this the global south, it's not just for indigenous peoples, it's not just for peasants, anywhere we are, we have to be involved in this kind of activity. A substantial deglobalization. Uh, Cameron Tonkin Wise talks about elimination design or even the destruction of the designs that designers that we no, long, no longer want to live with and doing a new kind of design. Principles, we need to practice the counter designing in relation to the middle class way of life. To me, this is so clear in Latin American cities. I mean, if we look at, and probably most of the world, we look at neighborhoods, sort of gated communities in middle class Latin American large cities, we see a very anti-collective, anti individualizing, consumption-oriented, anti-ecological way of living. Is the, the, the occupation of urban space by this kind of sprawling uh, urbanization, which is very anti-ecological again, we need, that's a design challenge. So I just wanted to flag that for you as well. We need to be more mindful of how our bodies are grafted so much upon digital, digital technologies. This is one of the most clear examples that design, design us, that we design the world, we design digital technologies that were being designed by these digital technologies. They are great in so many different ways, that I'm not saying that we have to get rid of them, but we really need to be resituating them and thinking about a different kind of production of subjectivities through digital technologies uh, than just the superficial sort of freedom of choice when choice comes in, 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 the, in the form of prepackaged algorithms uh, that already define 
what the choices for us are. Practicing a disobedience to capitalist markets uh, and established orders of capitalist modernity in the state. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's move on to number four and number five, and then a very short conclusion. Latin American feminists are fond of saying that there is no decolonization of society without depetrarchalization. Uh, black feminists add that there has to be also deracialization of society. And this is, we're talking about patriarchy in an ontological sense. Patriarchy understood ontologically is that way of being that privileges hierarchies, domination, control, separation, appropriation, violence, and war. So it's a set of naturalized desires and subjectivities that we need to, to question. We want to move beyond this capitalist, capitalist which we live today. Uh, so patriarchy is the most enduring ontology. It becomes implicated with capitalism and with the state and with modern knowledges, et cetera, et cetera. But it has to be understood also in its own terms. And there is an entire new wave in, in, in many parts of the world, certainly in Latin America, but also in Europe, of feminist and anti-racist frameworks that emphasize the need for recommunalize and relocalize social life as a way to deal with this heteropatriarchal capitalism. Actions or designs can be centered on the reappropriation of collectively, of collectively produced goods and the reproduction of life. With COVID-19, the question and the issue of who is producing and reproducing life became to the fore again. This has been Silvia Federici long life work. I assume she's very well known in Italy, well, at least she's known in Italy. She's spent most of her time in the US over the past 40 years. Her work is having a new wave of interest. Uh, she was just um, a few days ago participating in a virtual forum in Colombia on, on these issues, sponsored by very well-known Colombian feminist politician, but the work of Rita Segato, Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar, and there's a whole set of new uh, communitarian and decolonial feminisms in Latin America that are focusing very much on that, on, on the reappropriation of the commons and so forth. And how part of deeper circulation is to heal this tapestry of interrelation, the and communities that we inhabit. So is the feminist and radical relational politics important for designing? I think this is another question that participants can discuss. Just to make it more explicitly, um, design then can be about repairing the damage done by this system. Latin American feminists in particular have a conceptualization that I call the communal popular feminine form of politics. Why the feminine, why not feminist? This would be a longer discussion, but it's a very feminist, anti-essentialist, historicized analysis of the relational and the communal. This is best summarized by Rita Segato, when she says that to opt for the relational path is to choose the historical project of being community. That's what we need to do today, she says to be able to oppose that regime of domination. This strategy from now on is feminine. What does it mean? I mean, it is, it is something that we can understand as designers, design thinkers, design makers. Uh, the strategy from now on has to be relational, communal, feminist, communal, popular, and so forth. How do we understand that? And again, just be reassured, even if I cannot explain at length here because of lack of time that this is not an essentialist formulation. Re-encountering Earth, I'll go a little bit fast, faster here because this is more well known for you. We need to start design with the Earth today and with the kinds of walls that we have constructed out of the Earth that are destroying the Earth. There are many ways of naming that need, Earth, Gaia, Pachamama, uh, dependent core risings, symbiogenesis, autopoiesis, 
Gaia as the interweaving of the network of life from Lynn Margulis. Uh, a symbiotic view of life. We have never been individuals. That's a paper, recent paper by a couple of authors whose name I can't recall right now, but interesting. We have been holobionts. We have been symbiotic beings from the, from the get-go again. So the earth emerges as a horizon from a renewed practice of living, of course, in the context of global capitalism. A very interesting nice book by just came out by Bruce Clark, who's written a lot about this, especially about Mar Lynn Margulis and neo-cybernetics, Gaian systems, um, if you want to take a look at that. The formulation of Earth by indigenous peoples is that, that Earth has been enslaved, especially by the Nas indigenous peoples from Southwest Colombia. Uh, Earth has been enslaved, and as long as she's enslaved, so are we, all of the people in the planet. So they call for the liberation of Mother Earth, which is a, a different way of living, but also they are engaged in a very uh, important, sophisticated movement for recovering their lands and the territories as a way to liberate Mother Earth. It's a movement that is going on right now. It's been going on for 15 years. It's very heavily repressed. And the COVID-19 has given the opportunity for all kinds of armed groups and actors to go into the territory, indigenous territories again to try to push people out and plant all kinds of things. To jump over this one because I'm running out of time. How about the cities? I mean, is, is any of these in, useful to the cities? So going back to Earth, how do we re-Earth the cities? How do we get down to Earth in cities? Uh, especially knowing that cities historically for 2,500 years or 2,000 years, I don't know how many, have been built at the expense of nature and also at the expense of peasant way of lives. So of course, and this is, I'm drawing the work of a really wonderful Colombian architect, uh, Harold Martinez, who says that the crisis, to, the contemporary crisis, the crisis of, of modes of habitability, habitability. And we need to come up with a new way of dwelling, a design of forms that expresses the idea that we are communal beings that inhabit a living planet a living universe, rather than individuals who occupy an inert soil. Um, so how do we design spaces, co-design spaces that really converse with the earth and with the environment? A couple of conclusions. We're all designers. We know that already. We're all design. We know that already from ontological design. So we need to take responsibility for the worlds we create. We know that. Uh, we have to do it almost anywhere, anytime. We are doing it almost. Interrupt the project of fitting all worlds into one. So a transition design is a practice for the healing of the web of life. If you wish, sketch a meme, a stitch, a loop at a time, collectively. Design is a pluriverse sustaining, weaving and repairing. I like this, that I quote from Designs of the Pluriverse. So the design is an open invitation for all of us to become mindful and effective weavers and repairers of the mesh of life. If life is a mesh of interdependencies and we are deeply part of that, how do we become different kinds of weavers, better kinds of weavers? Um, I'm going to leave that out. This is the, uh, the uh, summary of my presentation for the talk for the last week the conference in Manizales or the participatory design conference. We can go back to this in the discussion if we need to. Just to do the last, I think this is the last slide. So some ideas about participatory design, participatory relational design. So we need to resituate design within the collective and the earth. We need to live on design within a living universe. Uh, we need to develop tools and research methods and projects through which we can imagine participatory perspectives within communality and relationality. Uh, how about innovation? I mean, innovation, the concept of innovation has been hijacked by capitalism and, technolo and high technology. Um, and how about communitarian and relocalizing innovations? How about re-earthing innovations? How about innovations that deal with the patriarchal races and capitalist 
content of our contemporary lives. So we need to rethink innovation. And I guess this, that was the last thing that I wanted to say. And I'll leave you with a slide with the acknowledgements and then I'll stop sharing the screen in a moment so that we can begin the conversation. Thank you very much.